This is Racing Across America with Seth Merrow. Welcome back to Racing Across America on this Tuesday morning. Still reaching out to uh, Teresa Gennaro. In the meantime, just want to alert you. Uh, we talked about it yesterday with Dick Powell and uh, one of Dick's selections. Dick mentioned a few horses in there, but one of the ones he mentioned did win the two-mile race that stops the nation of Melbourne Cup last night about 11 o'clock our time. It was protectionist, the uh, German horse winning, and winning pretty convincingly. Kind of found a little slot there within the last eighth of a mile and uh, shot through it and took off under the very talented international jockey, Ryan Moore. It is a, pre a precisionist winning Red Cadeau. The world traveler winds up running second in there. And who shot the barman uh, comes in uh, off of a 11th place finish in the Caul Caulfield Cup and uh, runs third in there. Sign off runs fourth. Sign off fourth in the field of 22. There were two scratches. There was a scratch we knew about yesterday early. There was a later scratch. So the field of 22, sign off runs fourth. Sign off had last run on Saturday in the Lexus Stakes. So off the three day rest, comes back at two miles and runs a, a decent fourth in there. There was a quirky situation in the Melbourne Cup where two of the horses had uh, fatal situations after the race was over. Race favorite, Meyer Rakti, uh, who was kind of up uh, and in the running early and then faded to be a, a very, very disappointing last, went back to the unsaddling area and collapsed and uh, subsequently uh, died. Uh, so that was bizarre. And then the uh, horse that finished seventh, Araldo, was on the way back to the saddling area, uh, was spooked by somebody waving a flag, reared up, caught the leg in a fence, and, and had to be uh, euthanized there. So a couple of quirky post-race fatalities with the Melbourne Cup, but it was precisionist, the German horse winning the race. All right, we are joined now by Teresa Gennaro, Brooklyn Backstretch blog, Forbes.com, Summertime Pink Sheet, and various other venues. Good morning, Teresa. Good morning, Seth. How are you? Very good. Happy to have you on board for a little Breeders' Cup discussion. And speaking of Forbes.com, I'll apologize right here to your readers on Forbes.com because you put together a, a couple of nice columns, not only Breeders' Cup, but the Triple Crown races as well, where you reach out to some public handicappers and put together five or six of them and get their selections on some big races. And the Breeders' Cup, you had a, a column, Forbes.com, Friday and Saturday. And I participated on the panel. And Friday, I think I had a little something. And on Saturday, I kind of whiffed. But I have to apologize because personally, and I've said it here on the show before, I hit the mile exacta. And for some, I'm the big four horse exacta box guy. And for some reason on your page, I got all kinds of crazy frugal in that race and only went three deep. And my fourth pick was the winner for that $600 exacta. So why I became frugal on the page, I have no idea. But again, I'll apologize to your readers. You're going to have to make it up to them uh, when the Triple Crown <laughs> comes around next year, that's all. Yeah, I will have to be a little bit bolder. Because uh, I, like I say, I, I went back and read the uh, article because I'd kind of forgotten what, what plays I'd put together. And I got to that race and I thought, what was I thinking? Why did I, all of a sudden I become Mr. Uh, Pennywise and Pound Foolish there? But that's, the, that's what horse racing is all about. But let's uh, shift our attention now. You were out uh, in Southern California on the weekend. Before we get to some specifics, news and human interest stories and whatnot, just curious about your thoughts on the overall atmosphere, the fans, the buzz out there in the L.A. area, the, the attendance was reported uh, Friday at about 37,000, Saturday about 61, so pretty good numbers. And Again, what was the buzz out there? It was my first time out there, so I don't, ha don't have anything to compare it to. Um, Friday definitely seemed kind of quiet. Um, I, you know, having, not being terribly familiar with Santa Anita, I don't know what a big crowd feels like. You know, I don't, it, it didn't feel to me like there were 30,000 plus people there, but it may be that the place is just big enough that, that you never get that feeling. Also, the weather on Friday was not so great, um, or Saturday. It, it cleared up a little bit on Saturday, so I wondered if that had something to do with maybe um, keeping the crowd down a little bit. Um, but the folks that were there seemed pretty enthusiastic. It's an absolutely stunning place, both inside and out. Obviously, that background is, uh, is just incredible. But even, you know, the inside at Santa Anita, they seem to really, you know, try to take care of their guests. 
Um, and it was, a, it was a great experience to be there. I didn't see much of uh, Pasadena um, or Arcadia, but, you know, went out to dinner a couple of nights, and it was a little bit like being in Saratoga in the summer, and that, you know, at every other table there was somebody affiliated with horse racing. Probably not like that year-round, but it certainly was last weekend. Oh, that's interesting, because you think of L.A., it would be diluted a little bit, but I suppose even in big cities and the areas around the racetrack, that kind of holds up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I mean, to be honest, I don't, you know, I, I didn't feel like I was in Los Angeles. Um, not that I've ever been there, so I don't really know what it feels like, but it definitely felt like we were, you know, sort of outside of a city. And talk a little bit about the weather. For, for those of us watching on television, they mentioned it. We had Dick Powell on yesterday, and he mentioned it. But I guess, which from everything I've read, is fairly unusual for this time of year, they got hit with a pretty good rainstorm on Friday night. Yeah, Friday night. It didn't start till late in the evening. Um, the day was pretty cloudy, a little bit foggy early on. Um, it, was, it was warm enough. I think it was, you know, maybe in the 60s or, or the low 70s, but it was definitely overcast for a good part of the day. Rain overnight. I don't think it rained quite as hard as people were saying that it might, although the rain did continue through much of the night and into the next morning. Um, and Saturday morning was, was pretty chilly. I think I woke up, it was about 45 degrees. Um, definitely warmed up as the day went on. Sun peaked out a little bit at the end, but... Um, yeah, you know, escaping Brooklyn in the late autumn. I was not <laughs> expecting to go there um, and needing sweaters and, uh, and boots, but that's what, that's what it was. And, and talk a little bit more about the venue. You've talked about the facility itself, but uh, just, you know, looking at, looking at it on television and reading people's comments, it, the, the, the vista itself is kind of breathtaking. It's, it's, it's one of those things where you look at all those pictures that people post all the time and you think, my God, it can't really be that beautiful, can it? But it, but it really is. I mean, it's just... It is absolutely stunning, and the way the light changes um, over the mountains and looking at the sunrise at one end of them and sunset on the other, it was, it's, it's really breathtaking. And give, us, give me a little feel of what the press box was like. Uh, Breeders' Cup and, you, you know, uh, the press box at the Belmont uh, this year was full. The press box at Saratoga varies, uh, you know, weekends and whatnot. But uh, press box for the Breeders' Cup, what's that look like in year 2014? Well, it's interesting because the press box proper, which is to high up um, and overlooks the track, is, is really quite small, probably only accommodates a couple of dozen people. So they have what they call an auxiliary press box, which is down essentially on the first turn of the track, um, and it's outside. So you're sort of sitting there with you know, maybe, maybe a sixteenth of a mile past the wire. There were a couple of hundred people all out there. Um, and so when the weather was nice, it was really it was stunning to just be sitting out there uh, in the warm weather. But there, were, there was an Italian guy sitting next to me. There were some Japanese people in front of me, tons of Brits all over the place. So it was really an incredible international press corps that was there. Interesting. And, and of course, we had some locals there. I know Tim Wilkin was out there. And, of course, uh, mm -hmm. Barbara, uh, the, the, the local photography crew, I understand, was all out there. Uh, Dave Harmon, Skip Dickstein, and, and Barbara Livingston. So that's, that's always fun. And I saw a couple of them on TV as well. How, how convenient is it if it's on the first turn that for them, uh, for the, those folks to then make it to the winner's circle for post-race interviews, or is there another kind of venue set up for that? There's a little, uh, there's a venue set up for it. There, for after every Breeders' Cup race, there's a little tent out behind the grandstand, sort of toward the paddock, um, and it's a little bit of a walk, but it's fine. You have plenty of time to prepare for it. So they do the winner's circle presentation, then they bring all the connections back to have a little bit of champagne, and then they do a press conference. In a, in a little room back there. And speaking of the paddock, it, it's hard for me to get a, a, to judge that well on television. What, what's the paddock, what's the size of the paddock like out of Santa Anita? It, it's small, but again, you know, there were so many people there that it was packed all the time. Um, but uh, it's, you know, it's beautiful. There's a, there are, there's a statue of Seabiscuit right there um, in the middle of it. Um, but it did, it did feel a little on the small side, but there's a really kind of lovely horse path that winds down through the building, um, actually right below the room where the folks are brought to have champagne after it, which is a which is a lovely, uh, you know, a lovely vantage point. Um, but the paddock is a little small, but but the building is is so imposing, and you have this the lovely architecture that overlooks it. Um, so it's it's a beautiful spot. All right, let's talk a little bit about some of the specific uh, news stories and human interest and whatnot that came out of it. I want to touch a little bit on uh, the big story from Friday. Obviously, Untappable looked very good winning the distaff. And then Rosie Napravnik with the surprise announcement in the winner's circle. She retired on Sunday to start a family. Talked to, again to Dick Powell yesterday, and he said 
that, that from where he was, it was hard to hear what was being said in the winner's circle. So everybody was kind of aware of her mentioning something about starting a family, but he didn't realize until later on that she had actually announced her retirement. Were you able to pick up on that? And when you eventually did, what was the buzz around the track and around you about Rosie's retirement? Uh, I was not in the winner's circle for that race. I was um, uh, back at my laptop doing some uh, updates on it. And so I heard about it because it was announced on social media, and I believe maybe even on the NBC broadcast, although I'm not sure. Oh, it was. We're, we're watching it. the tape right here. She, she mentioned it on the NBC broadcast in the winner's circle in the post-race interview. But as I say, yeah. Dick said you, we didn't really get that NBC broadcast where he was. So, so he right. was on track. It was, wasn't quite as apparent necessarily. Right. And because they do these press conferences away from the winner's circle, there aren't that many media in the winner's circle. There are a few there, but it's really crowded. You know, all the connections are there, all the, all the TV people are there. So I think that the word got out to the TV audience and the social media audience before people, you know, in the immediate vicinity got it. And, you know, it definitely, um, in some ways, you know, kind of distracted from the pretty incredible things that Untappable did this year and capping off her year like that. It, and it, it, it was certainly the story of uh, Friday as compared to Untappable, and I wonder how that will shake out because now I think Untappable is, is, is a long shot, but you'd have to think she's maybe in the, the running for a uh, thoughts at least for Horse of the Year, and will there be some pushback at the announcement being made, and as you say, maybe taking a little bit away from uh, her star power, but it was uh, kind of a fun end to uh, uh, the, uh, the, the Friday of uh, the Breeders' Cup with that announcement being made uh, on national television. Her mother was there in the winner's circle, as we just saw as well. But, but again, what was the, when people finally realized it, what was the buzz about her ending her career and se seven weeks pregnant and stepping aside? Um, I, I think people were gobsmacked. They were like, whoa, you know, nobody expected it. Um, I, you know, Rosie... Nipravnik tweeted the next day that she hadn't intended to make the announcement then, but she was so overcome with Untappable's win that, that she just kind of blurted it out. Um, you know, I think it, it became the story, you know, as you said, and, as, and as, as you said, I think Dick Powell said as well, it sort of became the story. And there were more quotes from Rosie afterward than there were from Steve Asmussen or from the Winchells, you know, whose horse had just won. Um, and then there were some, you know, more cynical types who said, you know, maybe that's a blessing because... Then Steve Asmussen didn't get as much camera time in oh. terms of all the, you know, negative press around that. Um, you know, some people said, well, maybe it was planned, so it took some of the heat off Steve. You know, I, and that feels like it's going down a little bit of a conspiracy theory path. Um, and I think there were some people who wondered why she didn't just wait till Sunday. Yeah, all of that is interesting, and I hadn't even thought of the Steve Asmussen aspect, but that's intriguing as well. But yeah, plan seems a little cynical, but it, but yeah. <laughs> but uh, that happening uh, as an afterthought, yeah, that, that's that's very intriguing. All right, let's uh, shift our attention out to Saturday because I'd love to know the buzz in the press box after the Breeders' Cup Classic. You wrote a nice story for Forbes where you talked about the controversy of the Breeders' Cup Classic and then went on to talk about the race itself and whatnot. And that ha kind of has been the discussion. There was a lot of controversy. As I put our articles up on Equidaily immediately after the race, there was a lot of focus on the controversy. That continues, but then people were also willing to say, well, you know, given the circumstances, it was a nice race by Bayern, given that. And then there was a lot of discussion also on how things will shape out eclipse-wise. Uh, now the, the NTRA poll came out yesterday, main sequence number one now. So that horse of the year eclipse conversation becomes very intriguing coming out of the Breeders' Cup Classic. But again, I'd love to know press box and just around the track and as you walked around and subsequently as you've talked to people and whatnot, what are the thoughts overall in the Breeders' Cup and particularly that controversy uh, with the non-DQ at the start? Well, as I said, the, our seats were up beyond the finish line, and there were plenty of screens all around us. But I, as they went into the gate, I was looking down the stretch directly at the gate. And it's, you know, it's a couple of furlongs away, but you had a pretty good view of it. And, you know, the starting gate opened, and I looked at somebody next to me and said, who's that horse who just, you know, clocked all those other horses? And you couldn't really tell who it was from there. And then, you know, Byron gets the lead, and... I wasn't watching it on television, so I didn't have, you know, that, that great view of the whole field. It wasn't until after the race and the inquiry went up that I realized that that horse who had done that was actually Bayern. He had knocked out, you know, the fellow pace setter Moreno, um, you know, clocked shared belief pretty well, who ended up coming back and running really well to finish fourth. 
you know, I, I have talked to very few people who don't think he should have come down while at the same time acknowledging that it's incredibly unlikely that in a race of that magnitude the stewards are going to going to make a call like that. But I, most people I've talked to, and I feel the same way. I mean, I, I don't under I don't understand how you knock into the favorite, you knock into your fellow pace setter. It absolutely changed the dynamic of the race within the first few strides. Not to mention the fact that it's incredibly dangerous, and Martin Garcia may not have been able to, to control the horse. It looked like the horse kind of acted on his own there. But still, I mean, just sort of from both an integrity and a safety standpoint, it's, it's a head scratcher, as you might say. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And uh, that was kind of my thought, too, as far as, you know, will they take the horse down? And it wasn't even the big race question for me. It was at the gate. They, they are so, it, it, you know, those gate things happen, and stewards just don't seem to concentrate on anything but other than uh, other than the stretch most of the time and so right after the race was over all things being equal I said this yesterday I would have been about 80 20 in favor of a DQ but that was again all things being equal given it was at the starting gate I thought it was probably 40 60 uh, you know against them uh, coming up with a DQ and that's the way it turned out and I agree just uh, looking at the comments and linking to articles on Equidaily over the past couple of days, the vast majority of people are really being critical. And I, I said earlier on the show, I, I posted on Equidaily right after the race the uh, actual rule, which refers to a part of the track. This has to happen in a part of the track, giving the stewards discretion to make the decision. And I, I can't figure out what that a part of the track. I got to get in touch with the CHRB and see if mm -hmm. why the qualification. Why you know if you're going to give the stewards discretion, I have no problem with that. But if uh, interference affects the outcome of the race, why do they have that wording in there? A part of the track. I don't. Obviously, they dropped it in to qualify the rule some way, but I, I can't quite figure out why. And so I have to, to get in touch, as I say, and maybe have somebody explain that a little bit. But overall, again, after the race. It seemed like to you the majority of the people were were upset that there was no DQ. Absolutely, and it was you know it was kind of weird you know for the second day in a row, the race the story, yeah. in some ways wasn't really the story. You know, on, at the end of Friday, it wasn't about Untappable. It was about the Pravnik, and on Saturday, it wasn't about what a great race it was. It was about Bayern and a disqualification. Um, so it was kind of weird. Both both days ended with people not really talking about the race so much as they were talking about uh, about other elements of it, um, which is kind of a shame, you know? I mean, you know, on, on the one hand, Byron's had an incredible year, and, you know, maybe he won a fair and square, maybe he didn't. Um, you know, it was a, kind of an incredible performance regardless of how, how it started, and under different circumstances, you might be looking at this point as a clear-cut three-year-old champion and horse of the year, and instead it's maybe more up in the air than it was before the race. Yeah, it, 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 uh, I think it was Jay Privnett. Jay Pribman, I think, said uh, a wholly unsatisfying ending. And I think that's kind of the way I came away with it, too. Um, it, it's, as you say, the story was more the controversy than the race itself. And the race itself, you know, we lost a lot of marquee players coming into the Breeders' Cup. But still, this classic had all kinds of eclipse implications. Uh, California Chrome facing off against Shared Belief was going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and it, it just it took a, a little something away from that but you know it is what it is now we have to move forward but it's going to be interesting to see how this conversation plays out and i'm wondering if it's going to cause racing jurisdictions to maybe take a little bit of a different look at how stewards react to what happens at the start of the race i think that would be a positive so we'll see what happens but let's uh, move on and just get some ideas on some of the other human interest stories from the weekend uh, we'll touch on one that has new york connections and you follow new york racing and you're out the track on the weekend, certainly. Leah Giamatti with a third place finish uh, in the juvenile Phillies with the New York bred Wonder Gal. Unfortunately, sweet reason in the Philly and Mayor Sprint for Leah, not quite as uh, good running eighth in the field of 10. But as I say, Wonder Gal, uh, New York bred runs third. A little bit later, not a Leah Giamatti horse, but a Chad Brown horse, day of the, a day at the spa. Uh, another New York bred though. Uh, then you throw upstart into the mix. Good day for New York breds. And with the third place finish, I think it was an okay day for Leah Giamatti as well. I thought Wonder Gal ran great. Yeah. You know, I, 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 don't, I think there was no disgrace in her finish there. Obviously, it would have been nice if she'd won, you know, Leah shipping out there for the second year in a row. But to go out there with two Breeders' Cup starters, um, come away with the placing. I mean, I, I haven't talked to Leah. I don't know what her thoughts are about Sweet Reason. Um, I mean, maybe the horse wasn't quite ready. She did lose some training because of the incident in the cotillion. 
uh, where she got the eye injury, or, you know, maybe she just doesn't like it out there. You know, she's gone out there twice now and hasn't run particularly well. Um, but to come away, you know, with, in her, in her, with her, I guess, what, third Breeders, second or third Breeders' Cup starter and to get a placing, I think that's terrific. She's obviously had a tremendous couple of years, and her profile has gone up so much thanks to her owner, Jeff, Jeff Treadway, and a couple of other loyal owners that she's got. And, yeah, I mean, New York breads aren't a punchline anymore. Um, Dave Despa is the second uh, Breeders' Cup winner who was New York bred. There was that horse last year called London, I believe his name was. Um, they had the spot then sold yesterday at the sale for, I think, $2.1 million. Um, and I believe she was purchased by Barbara Banky and Stone yeah. Street. So, yeah. um, you know, that's, you know, a couple of years ago, people were making a lot of fun of New York breads. And Funny Side was, seemed to be an exception. And I don't think, uh, I don't think that's the case anymore. Yeah, hats off to the New York bread programming. And speaking of New York breads, touch on one more human interest story. A really big weekend for Chad Brown. And I don't know whether you guys got this because again, he, he made these comments on the NBC broadcast. I don't know whether it filtered through to later interviews or whatnot, but Chad Brown with day at the spa, he, he said this horse was better maybe at a mile, but going with what is, uh, uh, mentor Bobby Frankel had done er earlier in the Breeders' Cup, he thought she might be okay going uh, uh, the distance of the Philly and Mayor turf. Maybe get out there and get an easy lead and take them all the way around. So he credited Bobby Frankel in that race, and then, of course, he wins later with Bobby's kitten named in honor of yeah. Bobby Frankel. So on the NBC broadcast, he was paying a lot of tribute to his mentor, uh, Bobby Frankel, but really a, a nice weekend for Chad Brown, who went into the weekend with a profile in the New York Times. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, so... Uh, Tremendous high-profile weekend for him. And I also I saw on Facebook earlier today, um, and I haven't, I haven't been able to look into it, but I believe Ron Anderson, the jockey agent, posted it. But there was a, a – that Chad brought one of his Breeders' Cup blankets to Bobby's grave and put oh. it over. And so there's a picture on Facebook, and I'm not even sure who posted it, but you might be able to track it down, of the Breeders' Cup blanket, one of Chad's Breeders' Cup blankets on Bobby's grave, which is obviously – you know, incredibly touching. He also had um, Frankel's uh, former assistant Ascanio in the winter circle with him. So it really was kind of an, inc an incredible tribute to, to Frankel in his home state. Yeah, again, there was, there was a little bit of everything. There was chalk on Friday. There were prices uh, on Saturday. There was really nice human interest stories. There was controversy. There was a little bit of everything. And it was fun to get uh, some firsthand thoughts on that for, from uh, someone who was out there uh, on the weekend. And, Teresa, before we let you go, I want to shift our attention just uh, right up the road because uh, you're up here uh, every summer covering the Saratoga meet. As I say, you're a regular in the pink sheet and many other venues uh, when the uh, Saratoga meet runs. And some news came out of the uh, Times Union yesterday. According to their sources, they're going to stick to the 40-day uh, meet, similar to what we've had the past couple of years up at Saratoga, despite things being discussed and maybe extending out a little bit and going to a five-day a week situation. It looks like they'll stick to the calendar the way it was. What are your thoughts? And I, I've already said I, I think it's a good idea because I think extending it, you just, I, I, my feeling is they're almost on the verge already of killing the goose that laid the golden egg. And I'm just afraid ex expanding it will, you know, tip that over the edge. Well, I have a couple of thoughts on it. One of which is that I saw earlier today reported somewhere that some upstate news outlet had talked to another board member who said that no decision has been made yet. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. I have no idea. I think it's a Twitter account called the Saratoga Blog, which is affiliated with the Times Union, I believe, um, and they may have said that. Um, I, I'm of two minds. You know, I mean, Saratoga is my home. I love going back there. Another week or so up there, it's fine with me. Particularly if you're not, um, if you're not uh, actually increasing the number of racing days. I think it would also be kind of an incredible thing for a lot of people up there to have two days off a week instead of one. It's really grueling for for horses, for, for the grooms, for everybody on the backstretch, on the front side, and the Naira employees to actually have a couple of days off a week would be a good thing. But it's hard to argue, you know, against the decision to keep it as it is as well. I mean, I'm kind of, you know, six to one, half a dozen of another on it. Yeah, and that would definitely be the positive, the five-day-a-week thing, and as you say, with a couple of days off, because, uh, you know, we, we – uh, on Racing Across America, we'll talk to jockeys and trainers, and you've written about it a lot. The, the jockeys and trainers, the owners, 
it's also a big social season. There are a lot of charity events, and all of these people participate in that. And that just, you know, you're out late at night, and you've got to get up early in the morning, and you're doing that six days a week. That has to take something out of these folks. So a couple days off would be a bonus. But, it, I, boy, I, as I say, I just I'm worried that they're going longer, even with the same number of days, just may take the specialness out of it. And, and I will reiterate, yeah, I, I didn't see what you saw this morning, but as I said, uh, when I linked on Equidaily, it's sources report. That was kind of the, what my takeaway from the Times Union story. It wasn't uh, uh, set in concrete necessarily, but that seemed to be the way they're tilting. But it's interesting to hear another take uh, being put out there this morning. We'll see. I mean, nothing, uh, you know, they haven't come out with an official statement yet, so there is nothing, uh, again, set in concrete. We'll see how it shakes out as we get closer. But, Teresa, as always, we appreciate the visit. Again, people can find uh, your work on the Bro Brooklyn Backstretch blog, Forbes.com, and many other locations. Again, appreciate the visit. We'll talk to you again.